it's such a treat to have organizers on the front lines leading um, opposition and resistance movements to the dirty energy industry uh, of this country and this, this planet. Um, uh, we need them. We need us to, to make sure that that resistance is strong. Again, you know, it's such a treat to, to bring folks who are on the front lines of this, um, of this movement uh, for really the broadly a movement for climate justice, that, that we need the resistance to be very much a part of that as well as the, the visionary, the world uh, we're, we're building. And so um, in order to lead our way out of the climate chaos, um, we really need to name the enemy, right? Um, that we have an energy problem, that we have uh, this, this country and our, and our society is addicted to fossil fuels and we need to break away from that addiction. Uh, what, you know, it's, it's the, the lifeblood of, of, uh, of these industries that are, that are harming our people and planet. Uh, whether it's the, you know, what, what powers our transportation, right? The, d the dirty energy that's part of that. What powers um, uh, our electricity when we turn on the lights or our computers or our phones. Um, and uh, and it's, they, they try to make that invisible. And so it, uh, uh, resistance movements to fossil fuels really needs to name Name what's wrong, name the enemy, call out its ugliness, protest its evil, smash it so that we make room for the, the world that we want to live in, right? And so um, uh, this resistance movement to fossil fuels, to oil, to gas, to dirty energy, to extreme energy is critical um, to the broader climate justice movement. And um, a good example of that is actually um, a true, the true cost of Chevron um, network. Has anybody heard of the true cost of Chevron network? So all these, these organizations, both locally, especially um, grassroots groups from Richmond, environmental justice groups um, opposing Chevron and the refinery here, um, to folks in the Philippines um, who are opposing the, the oil depots that are right next to uh, uh, universities and homes and the presidential palace, uh, to uh, folks in Nigeria and Ecuador um, opposing all the different ways that, um, for instance, the oil industry is impacting um, our planet and communities from the ref uh, from the, the mining of the oil to the processing and refining of the oil to the consumption that we really need to look at that um, lifeline of this this dirty energy um, economy and that we need to uh, the resistance movements um, and organizations need to be um, organized at each of those junctures because the, certainly these corporations are organized in all of those junctures and we need to have our shit together to make sure we're organized at all of those junctures. And so, um, and so we're seeing groups um, at these different junctures coalesce um, against um, the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so we uh, get to hear um, from uh, grassroots community folks who can stare down an oil giant and win. Uh, so Andres from Communities for Environment Environment uh, will share uh, that, that exciting work. That we have folks who are organizing the, the anti-fracking movement that's going to stop this madness. And we have uh, Rose from the Center for Biological Diversity uh, doing that. And we have smart student leaders who can look at the amounts of investment in our economy and look at how we can actually um, uh, divest from uh, the dirty energy um, uh, economy and in, in, instead that we have options to invest in, in cleaner things. And so Zen from uh, the California Student Sustainability uh, Coalition is going to enlighten us in, um, uh, with, with that work. And so first we will um, turn to Andres and uh, um, hear from him. Thank you, Mario Rose. So um, my name is Andres Soto, and I'm from Richmond. And um, I started working for Communities for a Better Environment one week before the Chevron refinery blew up. 
But having been a lifelong resident of Richmond, I've always been an ally of CBE, West County Toxics Coalition, and other pioneers of the environmental justice movement in Richmond and West County in general. And, you know, that's one of the things we have a lot to be proud of in Richmond is that uh, we have this long legacy over 30 years of environmental justice struggle and helping put a name on the movement of environmental justice. And so, you know, we're a community that is working class, middle class, uh, poor class, and extremely poor class. We have few pockets of wealthy people. But of course, we have um, a major uh, history of industrial uh, development in the city of Richmond, both, uh, of course, the World War II generation of the shipbuilding, the Kaiser shipyards, and the toxic legacy that that presented to our community, but also the fact that um, the precursors to Chevron, Standard Oil of California, and Pacific Oil before that, established itself in Richmond in 1902, five years before the city of Richmond was even incorporated. So uh, Richmond and the refinery grew up together. And one of the things, you know, that we're, we were taught many years ago is think globally, act locally. So we believe in Richmond we have a tremendous responsibility to the broader world as well as our own parochial interests in our community to do something about the Richmond refinery and its impact. Because its impact is not just its industrial pollution immediately in our community, but it's the first refinery in a string of refineries uh, in Northern California. All oil refineries in Northern California are located in Contra Costa County or Solano County along the Carquinas Straits. And if you know the prevailing winds, the winds actually blow the pollution right past us and into the Central Valley where it tends to mix with the agricultural pollution from soil as well as, uh, you know, which, which has the pesticides and herbicides. Uh, as well as the, uh, the ambient air out there from automobiles, you know, Highway 5 and Highway 99 and all the, the agricultural activity out there. So Fresno actually has worse air quality than Los Angeles. And that's the issue facing the folks out in the, in the Central Valley. So we understand we have both a local uh, as well as uh, regional and global responsibility. Now, one of the things, uh, as Mari Rose was, was framing, you know, our discussion today about the impact of this industry on the global climate, uh, there's another impact that is very devastating, and we've been feeling it for a number of years on the ground in Richmond, and that's the political corruption that goes along with this industry. And uh, we just had a press conference on Tuesday where our mayor, Gail McLaughlin, recently came back from Ecuador uh, visiting the Lago Agrio region and observing firsthand the pollution that was left over by Texaco and ultimately Chevron. And you may know that uh, an $18 billion judgment was issued against Chevron in the Ecuadorian courts. So Chevron did some forum shopping, came to the United States, to New York. They found a, an industry-friendly judge, uh, Lewis Kaplan, and they have instituted a RICO trial against the indigenous people in Ecuador and Rainforest Action Network for uh, the judgment of $18 billion against them, saying that they conspired to bribe a judge. And uh, that was the RICO charge. You know, normally it goes after organized crime. Well, I would submit to you the real organized criminals are the oil cartels that dominate the world politics and economy. That being said, we've been dealing with it in Richmond where in the last two election cycles alone, Chevron has spent $1.2 million in each of the last Richmond City Council elections. And our side, the Richmond Progressive Alliance, and all of our allies, uh, you know, I think the most one of our candidates raised was about $90,000. So that tells you what we're up against. But what we have on our side are the people and organizing the community. And like I said, we have a 30-year legacy of this, and part of that is working in alliance with other organizations. So APEN, uh, 350 Chevron Watch, 350 Bay Area, Urban Tilth, uh, ACE and other groups like that, Richmond Progressive Alliance, we've created a Richmond Environmental Justice Coalition. 
and we're going through the process of identifying what our Richmond platform is for a better future for Richmond. That's one of our activities. Uh, of course, we had a major march on August the 3rd to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the Chevron um, explosion and fire. On August 6, 2012, we turned out 3,000 people. Over 200 people got voluntarily arrested, and this made a major impact on our city. Chevron already knows what they're up against, so they've already bought billboards all around the city in English and Spanish with management personnel posing as workers saying they work there to protect uh, the refinery and the community. And so, you know, this is one of the things we're up against. We're also operating a, a regional coalition called the Refinery Action uh, Collaborative. And we're bringing together uh, workers, the United Steel workers, um, CBE, APEN, uh, Labor Occupational Health Program at UC Berkeley, and um, uh, Blue Green Alliance, believe it or not, as well as um, uh, other, well, those are the groups. And so, oh, and NRDC. So one of the things we're doing is beginning to unite the, uh, comp uh, the communities in Richmond, Rodeo, Crockett, Benicia and Pittsburgh. We're planning to bring these folks together because um, they all have these projects. And the big picture, the message I want you to go away with is that we need to work on each of these project areas individually to stop those projects or improve those projects. But we have a regional objective. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District is currently in the process of developing a regional rule on refinery emissions, stationary source emissions. And the big battle will be, will we be able to utilize a crude cap, limiting the quality of the crude that can be refined as a tool to reduce emissions. And with uh, cap and trade, if we don't do that, then that means they're going to be able to shit on us while buying credits somewhere else and call that a balance sheet under uh, Prop 32 cap and trade. Thank you. It was great to hear the different uh, local and regional coalitions that CBE is a part of. Um, we also, in, in, that, um, uh, uh, in that same line, um, want to call up Rose um, uh, from Center for Biological Diversity and uh, the coalition that's being built um, in California that's tied to uh, broader coalitions across the landscape, um, uh, making sure that we, we, put, we put a stop to, to fracking. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Rose, and thank you, Andres, everybody. It's really exciting to be here. Um, what I want like to do with my brief time with you is just very briefly outline what is fracking um, and also what is at stake here in California, and then give you a brief overview of the movement building strategy that we are engaging in with a lot of groups in this room and the more than 150 organizations that are part of Californians Against Fracking, the statewide coalition to ban fracking. Um, so for many years, you know, the oil and gas industries have been in trying to sell us on the idea that fracking is safe. All of this activity is safe, right? They've engaged in um, billion dollar ad campaigns. This is actually from outside of um, Shafter, California. I don't know if you can see the URL there. It's energy and oranges. No problem. Um, and they've engaged in things like this uh, coloring book. This is Talisman Terry. He is your friendly fracasaurus. And um, and all of this is real. <laughs> I didn't make it up. Um, so so what is fracking? Um, and the reason I'm going to do this is because up until two years ago, the state of California actually denied fracking was taking place here. So we, we tend to think of fracking as East Coast, Midwest, but actually it's California. So this is just a little graph of traditional oil and gas development. You know, we kind of use the put a straw down and suck it up method in pools of oil. And as this began to run out, oil and gas companies developed new ways of getting at um, what is um, in the shale formations. And the short story of what is fracking, it's taking millions of gallons of water laced with toxic chemicals. There are more than 632 different chemicals we know that are used in fracking. So it's laced with toxic chemicals and sand. It's um, injected under high pressure underground to break apart shale formations holding oil and natural gas. And there have been a few technological developments. I saw the hand go up. Am I allowed questions, Mary Rose, or should we? <laughs> uh, quick question and we'll add yeah. one to. Is, uh, is all of it coming from the water deliberately in there or accidentally? 
No, they're deliberately put in there, um, and they're all not, they don't use 632 chemicals in each frack job, but um, they're deliberately put in there to deal with flow and viscosity and breaking apart the shale formations. Um, there have been a few technological developments. One thing you'll hear oil, com oil and gas companies tell you is, we've been fracking for decades, no problem. And just to note, there are a few different technological developments that make today's fracking quite different than the fracking that previously occurred. One is rather than just drilling down, they're also drilling out horizontally up to two miles to get at the shale that's holding this oil and natural gas. Two is you see that slick water development in 1990, whatever that says, six. That's the chemical concoctions they've developed. And then the final thing there to point out is multi-stage slick water uh, fracturing. And that is, they've determined that if they actually put more wells out along that two mile stretch, they can get at more of the shale formation, which leads to intense, even more intense industrial development. And what this has really meant is um, these shale plays across the country have just revolutionized um, oil and gas development. I don't know if people saw, we're now going to be the number one, US number one, number one oil and gas. And that is something we just never thought. We, you know, we talked about peak oil, it's all over, blah, blah, blah. And that is just simply not what is happening here. Um, and to give you just a brief outline of what this looks like on the ground, if you flew into the Dallas-Fort Worth area in 1997, you see there on the left, those black dots are the vertical oil wells. If you flew in in 2009, those red dots represent the horizontal. And, and the reality is, is fracking is kind of traditional oil and gas development on steroids. It's on steroids, and it has really transformed our landscape. Um, and part of this is due to the way they get at the oil and gas, and part of this is due to the fact that these wells deplete extremely quickly. What's at stake here in California? Kirsten already mentioned this. Um, we have the nation's largest shale oil reserve. This is four times the size of the Bakken. We're talking about up to actually 15 billion, and I'll say that again, 15 billion barrels of oil. It's oil, not natural gas here in California. There is some natural gas, but the big play is oil. That's what's determined to be technically recoverable from the Monterey shale. And there are 500 billion barrels of oil in place there. So right now, those aren't determined to be technically or economically viable. But we're talking about a whole lot of oil, a big carbon bomb r sitting right under our feet. Um, the Monterey Shale, roughly, it's, it's a, bit, a huge part of our landscape here. It's 1,750 square miles running from the south of Santa Cruz all the way to the LA Basin. Ending in the Inglewood oil field, the nation's largest urban oil field. You can see the homes there. Right adjacent to it is actually here in California. And very briefly, um, as I mentioned, we didn't even know fracking was taking place, but um, these are, this is a map of where we've been able to confirm fracking is occurring based on voluntary uh, disclosure and the places where we suspect fracking is taking place in California. And the threats are numerous to our air, our water, our climate, our health, uh, earthquakes, wildlife, ecosystems. And um, does anybody know what that is? North Dakota. North Dakota. North Dakota. And that's flaring. And just in case you think um, that only happens in North Dakota, this is from Shafter, California. Um, down in the Central Valley, um, we're one of our community partners, the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment, is working with the community there. Um, there are fracking wells coming up adjacent to the community garden, adjacent to the school. You see the fracking well there in the back. So this is not North Dakota. This is not Pennsylvania. This is, this is not Texas. This is California. There's the homes there. So we've come together, oh dear, we've come together with a, a coalition of uh, more than 150 organizations to build a grassroots movement, which is what is going to be required to win this fight. We've got three main strategies uh, we're working under right now. One is targeting Governor Brown to place a moratorium, a strong moratorium on fracking. Two is we want to maintain the de facto moratorium we now have on uh, public lands, oil and gas development on public lands. And three is we're doing local organizing ordinances and resolutions. So we're bird dogging the governor. We have a petition here um, to the governor. We want to get more signatures on that petition than on any other petition um, in history. We don't know how many that is, but we think we can do it. 
Um, and so uh, we've uh, joined together. The, these are 650,000 comments on the new EPA rule on fracking. And these comments didn't say strengthen this rule, fix this tweak. They said ban fracking on public lands. And it was, it was uh, there were a total of a million comments submitted, but 650,000 of them were submitted by grassroots groups who said ban fracking on public lands. Um, this is from CRP, some of their listening sessions and trainings they've been doing in the Valley. Uh, there's an LA ordinance, the local organizing is super exciting. We are working with uh, LA City Council right now has a motion to uh, put a very strong moratorium on fracking in LA. And we have resolutions pending um, around the state from places that don't have fracking necessarily, like here in the Bay Area, resolutions to the governor to place a ban on fracking. And my final slide, how do we win? This is from a, um, a corporate thing of you know telling them how to stop us. And if you notice, uh, I think um, it's from our friends at Food and Water Watch. They're most concerned about outright bans, and they're most concerned about us joining together, right, and building a movement. And they recognize that that is the problem. So there you go. <laughs> Only you can prevent fossil fires. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. That was inspiring. Are you are you fired up out there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things uh, that gets me fired up is about how um, my kids, my two boys, are going to take on the, this banner um, to continue this work. And so when I hear about the leadership of our younger generation and students doing organizing, I get very excited and inspired. And so we're going to bring up Zen to um, to, to enlighten us on what uh, young folks and, and the role that young folks have in um, this movement. Thank you. Hey folks, my name is Zen. I'm a former student at UC Berkeley, just graduated this year. Um, thank you very much. Um, I how did I get involved in all this work? What is the CSSC, as we like to call it short, because uh, it is a mouthful. Well. I joined the California Student Sustainability Coalition about four, four and a half years ago when I was a community college student. I was enticed by the whole purpose behind a community of folks all the way from Arcata at the Humboldt State University down to San Diego State University. I was excited that students from the UC system, the California State University system, the community college and private schools were going to come together to work comprehensively on addressing some of the largest issues we face as a civilization, as a, as a species. And so the mission of CSSC, and why I was so excited about it, is that it works together, everyone works together to transform our institutions into models of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And so over the last decade of our, of our existence here in California, we've worked on a number of different campaigns to uh, stop, for example, um, the, the, uh, the gas company's efforts to eliminate uh, AB32, or climate change policy in California. We've worked to pass comprehensive uh, sustainability policies in the UC system, which transitioned millions of dollars into more sustainable practices and, um, and purchasing policies. And we've then further worked on um, grassroots mobilization on other key issues that affect not just the campus communities, but our local communities as well. And so we were found, so founded on the premise that we, we could do more together than, than any of us can do alone. Um, the biggest thing that we started working on um, recently was the End Coal Campaign. Launched in 2011, uh, it was a national effort to basically address divestment from the 15 uh, most toxic uh, and largest uh, coal companies um, currently operating on the East Coast. As you know, California doesn't have any coal companies currently operating in it. We, we source coal, and of course, coal is exported through our, through our ports. Um, so we definitely do have a hand in, in uh, supporting the industry. But more importantly, our universities themselves are heavily invested in these toxic assets. However, you can't just stop with focusing on coal, right? Because the issue is so much larger than the one industry, certainly much larger than just one fossil fuel source. And so about a year ago, with the support of 350's leadership, um, a national campaign was launched to divest from fossil fuels themselves. That's divesting from the 200 most toxic companies, the, the companies that have the most fossil fuel reserves, the companies that stand to benefit greatly from the Monterey Shell, for example, and to benefit greatly from the Richmond refinery and the action they're they taking there. 
And so with that work, we, um, we launched a national coalition campaign called Fossil Free. And we've been working on our campuses to divest the, the millions of dollars we currently have in these holdings. So the asset we have uh, for the campaign is to stop all new investments in fossil free companies, to drop all remaining investments, and to roll out a comprehensive reinvestment plan so we can redirect those funds for a more productive and, and constructive purpose. And so some of the successes the national campaign has had over the last several years has been the, um, the cities divesting. For example, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Richmond as well have di uh, chosen to divest their own investments from fossil fuel companies. And different campuses have as well, smaller private schools on the East Coast. The CSSC, um, through, our support, through our work with uh, our coalition par partners, has been able to put, call on nine different UC campus, campuses to call on a resolution for divestment and to push uh, on our UC regions, so those are the folks who, who govern our financial resources, um, to make that, um, uh, to finalize that resolution and to you know, effectively divest completely from fossil fuel holdings. We've seen a lot of success in that, in, that, in, that, in that arena because our theory of change is one of building alliances, partnerships. Uh, we like to build champions before we, we escalate tactics. And so that's allowed us to be able to work with them very closely on actually coming up with a plan that is respected and is timely. But there's still a lot of work to be done. So, the question you got to ask though is why divest? And certainly, why does it matter to even do it on a college campus? It's, it's kind of like a silo, right? It's not really something that's really well connected to campus or to the communities. And that's sometimes the truth. But as we've seen over the, over the last several decades with a lot of social change work, is that campuses play a huge role in many different ways. For one, a campus has a lot of political, economic, um, and, and you know, academic clout in many communities, certainly in terms of shifting policy at times. You, the reason I brought up this Harvard out of South Africa and the, uh, the known smoking uh, logos is because um, students ran divestment campaigns to divest from a part of the South African apartheid government and also pushed efforts to divest from tobacco companies as well, all of which were really successful and were able to have a significant impact on changing policy nationally and internationally. Nelson Mandela himself once said that uh, uh, because the UC system was able to divest from uh, the apartheid government, that it was a, enough of a significant blow politically, as well as somewhat uh, economically, that it, was, uh, it, it really uh, was able to shift uh, the momentum in favor of the, the, uh, the removal of the government. So there's many reasons why, right? There's a moral imperative of, of divestment. When you invest in something, you tacitly support that thing, right? You say, I believe this is something that's going to be beneficial for me, right? So any investment, though, as Vandana Shiva so perfectly says it, it's not an investment if it's destroying the planet, right? It's not very successful in that case. And it's not, we all know it's wrong for us to, to benefit from the destruction um, of, our, you know, of, our, of, our, of our earth of our, and the destruction of our communities as well. There's also a financial imperative, right? These are toxic assets. As people start, as, as more successful as we get within this movement, uh, the more people are shifting away from these resources, the more toxic this asset, these assets will become for, for these endowments, meaning that you won't get as much financial gain from these assets because they can become more of a liability than they are a benefit. Um, HSBC, for example, has, uh, that, the large bank has put together a report saying just that much. So it's definitely um, having repercussions uh, worldwide. So, it's important to recognize, though, that divestment itself is just one tactic to realizing the, the ultimate goal of climate justice, right? It's a tactic that can't just work within a silo. It can't just work within the silo of the university system. It has to be a tactic of many tactics. It has to be uh, launched by communities that work in conjunction with other communities. It has to be something that we, all uh, that we, that we comprehensively put together as a platform. And so, so you don't have too much time left, and so I want to kind of leave with um, this thought. So we're students, we work on these campuses. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in these microcosms of the, the political and economic um, you know, uh, mosaic here in America. Um, but it's important to recognize that students are, are, you know, are members of all of our communities. You know, I live in Berkeley, I went to UC Berkeley. For me, the Bay Area has been my home and always will be. Um, it's important for us to form coalitions with our community partners and students are allies 
uh, in that battle as well. So we've been working within the coalition, uh, the California Against Fracking Coalition, to, uh, to support anti-fracking efforts. Um, we're going to be launching the campaign in the fall. Uh, we're also uh, had a hand in the stuff that was happening with Chevron, and we're, we're working to push stuff uh, in our local city governments, uh, as well as state government as well. And you know, we're, we believe ourselves to be uh, you know, community members of the country and the earth. And so just tomorrow, actually, at 6.55 in the morning, I'll tell you, um, I'm going to be flying out to PowerShift with around 225 other students yeah, to, uh, to join thousands of other students around the country to push these efforts um, you know, in Pittsburgh to, uh, to, to make sure that we stop fracking and we divest from fossil fuels. So that's our platform, fossil freedoms. You know, we need to divest, we need to stop fracking, and we need to turn to something more productive, um, more sustainable reinvestments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zen. That was great. I think, um, you know, what you were talking about um, to make sure we're not in silos is that um, we have this opportunity with this amazing crowd. Um, we, I can suspect that you're all leaders in, in um, the areas that you take, um, that you work in, and that uh, uh, we need to, you know, this conference is to, to build those connections so that we're stronger together. We are connected. We, are we value, our we, value our our communities. we will stop fracking. We will divest from dirty energy. And we're going to win. Yeah, we All right. <laughs> Thank you, Andres and Rose and Jen.